Hello, fellow foodies. Welcome back. This is Dr. Cassandra Quaid, your host for the Foodie Pharmacology Podcast. Before we get started today, I have some exciting news to share and a big favor to ask. We're now in our fourth season of the podcast and have over 100 episodes available online with all of your favorite podcast streaming services. I just checked our latest stats and I was blown away to see that the show already has had more than 40,000 episode downloads. Just amazing. Um, We're also listed at number four on Feedspot's 25 best food science podcast list. So thank you, thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in each week. Um, And it's super rewarding to know that there's an audience out there enjoying the podcast and learning about the latest science behind our foods. And now for the big ask, the favor. I need your help. Can you commit to sharing the podcast with just one friend this week? Maybe send them a link to one of your favorite episodes. Um, I'd love to see the podcast expand its reach, and you can definitely help me to reach that goal. All right, now let's move on to the science. I'm really excited about the topic of today's show. We're going to be exploring a super interesting tuber crop in the genus Oxalis that's commonly known as Oka. And luckily for us, we have one of the world's leading experts on this South American food staple with us today, Dr. Eve M. Schwiller. Eve's research interests center on the ethnobotany, evolution, and conservation of crop plants and their wild relatives. She studies agrobiodiversity, especially the domestication of crops, their evolution under human influence, and their conservation biology. In particular, her work on the Andean tuber crop Oka, or Oxalis tuberosa, began with her PhD dissertation in the 1990s and has continued ever since. Her current projects include research on the phylogenetics and morphological evolution of the genus Oxalis in the origins of polyploidy and domestication of Oka in the context of its relationship with related wild Oxalis species, and the distribution of clones of Oka in traditional Andean agriculture. Eve has been a member of the faculty of the botany department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for more than 15 years, but arrived there via a very securitous route. Um, After completing her undergrad degree at Cornell, she and her husband moved to coastal Maine, where she continued working with plants, gardening at home with fruits and vegetables in a mini homestead, and for work in commercial greenhouses, a a cooperative seed company, and large ornamental plantings at a camp for developmentally disabled adults. After sharing heirloom seeds through the Seed Savers Exchange for a few years, Eve decided that she could do even more to serve the cause of conserving crop diversity by going back to school to help provide information for conservation from the lens of a scientist. And so after her graduate studies at Cornell, she worked seven years at the Field Museum in Chicago before coming to Madison, Wisconsin, where she now works as a professor. It's so great to see you today, Eve. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Great to see you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny because just uh, a a few episodes ago, I had the food writer um, and author Dan Saladino on the show, and he specifically gave a shout out to your work. And I was like, ah, it was like, of course, I've got to get Eve on the show. You've been on my list. And so I'm so, so excited that you're here. And I thought, you know, the audience is really probably not super well educated yet on what Oka is um, and kind of what type of crop it is. So maybe we could just start with some basics there. What can you tell us about this edible genus and how it's been used historically and and is used still today? Yeah, well, um, this is a a crop that's much more well known in the Andes and a few other places around the world than it is, say, in North America. Um, And so, or actually many other parts of the world, it's not well known. Um, It is a crop that was domesticated in the Andean region of South America. I've got Peru behind me. Peru and Bolivia is the places that I've done most of my field work and are the areas where it is grown most extensively. It, but it's also more grown in 
um, by people in rural communities. Um, in southern Peru and Bolivia, it's mostly Quechua and Aymara speaking um, smallholder farmers who grow it mostly for their own use, but all in depending on the community, some of them sell it um, when they have a surplus um, and others actually sell it mostly as a is to sell, but it um, has a very important place in their crop rotation system because you can't just grow potatoes year after year in the same ground without developing pests and diseases. Mm. So it's better to have some other crops, even if they're other tubers, to be part of the rotation system. And so it's also um, just more diversity in their diet. Um, mostly, um, well, they. I'll talk later about how they can dry the tubers to preserve them and then use those to eat. Mm -hmm. But um, it's important to have a diversity in your diet to reduce risk. Um, and um, it's second to potatoes um, among the various tuber crops from the Andes. Um, That's great. So, so for great diversity for there in the Andes, yeah. but it's not very well known around the rest of the world. Great. So for those of you that are um, interested in seeing some images of Oka, and also Eve has a great map behind her um, on the video version of the podcast, we've just pulled up an image of some of these different um, tubers. And these are all different varieties of Oka. Is that right? What can you tell us about yeah. this image? Well, they would be, this one that's up now is actually, this was one family's collection of tubers that they had an unusually large number of different clones of oka. You could call them folk cultivars, you could call them, um, but they're, they're each, they're clonally propagated, not from seed primarily. So like, you know, um, russet potatoes or something like that, they're one, each variety is pretty much a clone. Um, mm -hmm. So that particular image was from a family that had, um, in central Peru, that had a very large amount, number of different kinds in there in one family's collection. Um, so one of the things I have been trying to study is the distribution of all these different varieties. Um, had a study a few years ago about how they were um, distributed around Peru. And we were really surprised to find that so many of them, you know, even if they kind of looked a little similar, they'd be different genetically. And that each clone might be found in only a few of the places, you know, maybe one or two or three of the village places that we visited in Peru. Um, so they're really not spread out all, each variety is not spread out over the whole country. They're each found in just one or two or three places, most of them. The, the vast majority are actually found in only a few places. So conserving those is, a challenge. Um, yeah, uh, it's uh, you know there are collections in uh, international collections at the collection at the International Potato Center and national collections in each individual country. But I really now that we saw how limited the distribution was of each clone, we realized that they probably don't have all of them. I mean, the ones that we collected a number of years ago are now in um, the national. Germplasm Bank of Peru, um, but uh, you know, just realizing how limited their distributions are. Whether you're talking about um, a model like the Parque de la Papa, where they have, um, you know, they're conserving potato varieties in situ in the community, um, you would have to have hundreds of those all over Peru to really be able to. If each if each place was conserving their own diversity, which they're doing now, but um, I will say I'll jump to an observation I thought I might or might not like make later is that at the time that we were traveling, many of the communities like it might be only one or two elderly people who really had a big collection of oka, and we were worried that if the young people weren't taking up growing oka, in many cases they weren't. Um, what was going to happen to all that diversity over time. Um, mm, that's a really good point. I mean, and you also mentioned potatoes. We, we've discussed this on the show before about, you know, crop centers of origin and the great biodiversity we have of potato crops in the Andes. Are, are potatoes and oka, 
used interchangeably by locals or are there pretty big differences in their flavor or their taste or manners of preparation? They like, do yeah. taste different. There's, um, I mean, a lot of the time they might just boil them and that's would be the same. Or they, they also have a way that they cook them in earth ovens. Um, and they could do that with oka as well as with potatoes, like build a little structure um, out of clods of dry soil and start a fire inside of it. And when it's kind of down to coals, you throw in the tubers and other things in there and knock the whole thing down and it cooks underground. Um, and they do that in the rural communities with potatoes and with oka. So those are interchangeable. Um, but the way that they process the dried tubers is different because um, often they have to, the, there is a certain amount of oxalic acid and other organic acids in oka tubers. Some, most of them, a moderate amount, a few varieties I'll talk about later that have a lot more. Um, but they'll either set the oka tubers in the sun for up to a week to sweeten them in the sun, which reduces the organic acids, or for the really acid ones, they soak them in a stream or a pond for, um, I don't know, up to a month, I guess. And that helps to get rid of the, uh, the oxalic acid before they dry the tubers. That's, that's interesting. Like, let's break this down a little bit because I think many of our listeners may not be familiar with what oxalic acid is. This occurs as a plant defense kind of compound. Mm -hmm. We see this also in dock species. So like Rumax, if you, you know, it tastes, if you have in low levels, a little bit gives it almost like a vinegary taste in my experience, but in high levels can be quite poisonous. It's a, it's a, it can if be poisonous. Enough, yeah. yeah. If there's yeah. enough. And so detoxify and removing that's really important to making this a safe crop to eat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's the one thing is the, is the flavor tasting. Sometimes if it's just like the little bit of leaves of the, of the sorrels or wood sorrels, you know, you'd say, Oh, it tastes a little lemony or a little bit like mm -hmm. vinegar. But if you get too much of it, yeah, you're right. Um, it can either be acutely toxic. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, most of our foods are not going to bring that. If you toxicity around, unless you're really <laughs> extreme, mm -hmm. um, uh, but also it can uh, sort of attach onto calcium and make the calcium less accessible to your body. Um, mm. So if you happen to have a diet where you're sort of marginal in getting enough calcium, then the oxalic acid is going to make that worse. That's a really good point. Is there also like an issue with kidney toxicity if you have too many oxalates in your diet? Uh, yeah, uh, people yeah. talk about that. I'm not an expert on yeah. medical. Yeah, aspect. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But, you know, it's it's interesting. There, I think there are a good number of examples of, of crops that do have some toxicities, even the potato. I mean, I've, I've read um, Timothy John's work with the Aymara, Aymara um, mm -hmm. and how they're able to basically process these local varieties of, of potatoes in interesting ways, such as freezing and stomping or leaching in waters you just mentioned was being used um, for oka also mm -hmm. in the Andes mm -hmm. um, yeah. to reduce some of those potatoes. toxic compounds. Yeah, the bitter. Yeah. bitter I think potatoes. they also even have some edible clay that they can use to help detoxify mm -hmm. the, the alkal yeah. alkaloid ones. Yeah, yeah. It's so amazing. A lot yeah. of um, interesting ways of continuing to grow plants that have a certain toxicity and yet they know how to deal with the, um, with that, you know, I guess bitter manioc or cassava is another. Yeah. Example. Another one, cyanide bearing crops. Yeah. I mean, all three different tuber crops found in the, in, in South America that have some of these poisonous elements, but at the same time provide a huge, um, contribution to the diet. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, exactly. So exactly. what can you share with us about, you know, just, trying to frame this in mind for, for those in the audience that have never tasted oka, like what does boiled oka taste like? What's its texture like? Yeah. Yeah. I actually like it better that roasted under the ground, underground ovens, but okay. um, in either case, um, I actually, the only time I ever met my academic grandfather, who was Charles Heiser, who some people may have heard of, mm -hmm. um, he, um, he said that he had written in a few places that oka tasted like a baked apple. And what did I think of that? And I thought, you know, 
think that I used to tell people it tastes a little bit sweet and a little bit sour. And then I thought, oh, they're going to think of a sweet and sour sauce. And that's a little too sweet and sour. But a baked apple is about the right amount, balance of sweetness and tartness that compares to most mm. cooked oka. Um, it's just that I think baked apples are a little mushier than oka is when it's um, when it's cooked. But I think that's the closest when you have something that's a little bit sweet, but also a little bit tart. That's kind of, so nice. that compared to a potato is kind of different. <laughs> yeah, that's very different. It sounds delicious. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 it's definitely on my list of foods that I want to try someday. I've never had the opportunity to, to try Oka. And well, I guess this leads into my other question. When you, when you're in your research, you've really focused on small scale kind of household farming and, and conservation of diversity within these elements. Is there also any large scale cultivation of this? I just have never seen it really in trade, at least in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, like, well, is it available outside I'm the Andes? Not, I'm not aware of that happening in the Andes. And, um, but strangely enough, the one place in the world where that is happening that I'm aware of is in New Zealand, um, oh. which was kind of surprising to me to realize that, you know, in their latitude south and their climate and everything that Oka would grow, but apparently it does. Um, uh, and if you ever see it in a store in North America or Europe or any place like that, probably it was grown in New Zealand, not in the Andes. <laughs> That's amazing. It, yeah, the movement of plants for for that's that's really interesting. Yeah, wow. and there are a few people in in Europe, in um, I guess a few places in North America, um, especially the Pacific Northwest, where um, people are experimenting with growing oka, but also more on a household scale, not a commercial scale. Um, okay, so interesting. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, for baked apple tasting, um, source of food, it sounds <laughs> great. Well, let's let's jump into some of your research next. And I guess the first question I wanted to open with is, you know, can you explain to us why it's so important to conserve diversity of crops and the wild relatives of those crops? Mm -hmm. um, and where does Oka kind of fall into this? Yeah. Um, well, I know you've had some other people on the podcast not too long ago, um, uh, or over the course of your podcast that have talked about this before, but um, I just like to bring it up over and over again, um, uh, just to realize how much of the diversity of crop plants, you know, of the domesticated ones in met, people keep citing sort of like 75% has disappeared since, um, you know, in the past hundred years or something. Well, it's actually a lot more than 75% has disappeared. Um, uh, there's, um, in whatever crop plant you talk about, it's, there's really, I mean, depending on which one, it might be closer to 95% or more has disappeared over the past hundred plus years. Um, so our diet is becoming much less diverse, even though we think when we go to the grocery store, we see many more different kinds of, of um, vegetables there that we didn't used to have when I was young. Um, but, um, but worldwide, the diets in different parts of the world are becoming much more homogenized and um, the different varieties of crops that used to be grown, many of them have been disappearing for over a hundred years now. So um, that was something that I was, you know, I guess I read about back in the eighties when I was, was gardening both for work and for, mm -hmm. for uh, at home um, and uh, involved with the main organic farmers and gardeners, which then led me to the seed savers exchange and, um, you know, just I thought, well, I can help to conserve a few things, you know, heirloom varieties of beans or tomatoes, because those are the easiest ones for a beginner. Um, but then, you know, realizing that all over the world, these things are disappearing. And um, I hoped that I could help to, to conserve that. Um, for one thing, you know, if you don't have diversity of your crop, if a disease comes along, as many people may, some people might have heard is happening now with bananas, where there's one mm -hmm. clone of bananas all over the world, and there's a disease that it is not resistant to, and 
it's going to wipe out that variety of the banana pop calypse. Yeah. It's, it's what's, what's wild to me is, you know, this, the reason we have the Cavendish is because the, the prior clone, Grand Michel, big Mike (laughs) clone of the banana was wiped out by another fungus, a related fungus. Um, But we're somehow not learning the lessons here. We just, yeah. yeah. It's just so easy to grow one clone that, you know, ships well and has all Mm -hmm. of those things are good for large commercial scale um, commodification, Um, but we don't learn. Yeah. Or even going back to the, you know, Irish potato famine, that was pretty Mm -hmm. much all one clone of potatoes. So there was no resistance whatsoever. Um, So there's disease resistance. Um, So sometimes, you know, keeping those traditional varieties is really important because they may have some resistance and that diversity, but also the wild relatives can sometimes contribute even very surprising um, uh, alleles of genes to a crop. Um, I'm not a plant breeder, but I'd like to keep the stuff around so that future plant breeders might be able to use them. Um, uh, You know, people have introduced, I don't know, more iron into beans or um, more resistance into various crops, more um, resistance to um, either too wet or too dry or too hot or too cold, all these changes that um, will be coming at us uh, with climate change. And sometimes they've been able to, you know, you might have a little tiny tomato, but you can actually get some genetic material from a little tiny wild tomato to actually make tomatoes bigger. Um, So sometimes it's not what you can see Mm -hmm. in the wild relatives, but um, they can bring in traits that, you know, improve yield, even though the yield in the wild one is not very good, but they can really contribute also alleles, um, different genetic material to the crop to make the crop more improvement improved or maybe taste better or maybe nutritionally Mm -hmm. better or something. So um, preserving both the traditional heirloom varieties of the crop itself and the wild relatives is something that I has been what motivated my work for for years now. Um, (laughs) That's amazing because you're talking about, you know, ethnobotany and the importance of, of human knowledge and human traditions and propagating and, and having certain diverse varieties or cultivars persist over long periods of time. This is passed down from generation to generation. And then on the other hand, we also have, you know, these very advanced technologies that are, you know, have been developed or are being developed that can allow us to capture some of those genetic blueprints from the wild for future crops. I mean, I think the future is something we have to think about because this doesn't just happen overnight that you can just immediately come up with a solution. And, you know, considering some of the challenges we face with climate change, I mean, I've, I've heard some people state, you know, plants that are dependent on kind of higher elevation cultivation, like they can move up the mountain a little bit, but then what happens when you run out of mountain? <laughs> right? right. So we have to really think about, you know, what are we going to do to ensure uh, our food security, not only in terms of mass production through industrial agriculture, but also for the survival of, of indigenous peoples, of, of people that live in these small farms um, in rural areas across the globe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I think it's a, it's something that uh, there isn't as much awareness about that issue as other things. I know from my teaching, um, when I you know talk about the Svalbard global seed ball, mm-hmm. and you know that they even had to take some seeds out of it after one of the you know the. Um, germplasm bank in in Syria, the war overtook that one. And mm-hmm. so, you know, they didn't think they were going to have to take any out so soon, but it turned out that war caused them to have to take some out so that they could regrow and reestablish that collection and then send it back, of course. But, but um, uh, so many of, I asked students to watch a bunch of videos online and read some things online about that whole story and then reflect on it. And so many people say they had no idea. This is the first time they're hearing about this. So it is something that's just not, you know, it's not that we work on it all on the top. We were, you know, we're very aware of it, but um, lots of people aren't. (laughs) 
Well, I think it goes back to also the fact that so few of people, there's such a low number of folks that actually are connected to their own food system. So, you know, if growing up, if, 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 if one were growing up in the 1920s, like I'm you know, thinking of like my grandmother, she was acutely aware of what happens when you have crop failures, you know, mm-hmm. she lived on a farm there. There's when, when your crops fail, your family goes hungry and, 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 you know, throughout history time, you can find stories from every culture on earth. When you have crop failures, that's often tied to, you know, occurrences of war and conflict um, because people need access to those resources. And mm-hmm. so I think it's, it's such an important topic and, and we've got to raise more awareness about it and, and help people reconnect in some way to where their food comes from. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know just in the past few years of the pandemic, many more people are gardening at home than, yeah. than used to. So, you know, they'll be getting some awareness. So <laughs> some things work and sometimes don't. Yeah. Um, yep. so. <laughs> no, I'm definitely, I mean, my, my husband this year was telling me, he's like, he wants to have half the garden for himself and half for me. Cause I, I actually am not a very accomplished gardener. I like, I can grow mints, <laughs> you know, and some chili peppers. I'm very good with those and tomatoes, but like a lot of the other stuff, like I just completely fail. And he's like, you have to have more patience. You have to be out there every day. And I'm like, it's a learning process. <laughs> process but he yeah. wants to separate our plot so he could just prove to me how much of a better gardener he is <laughs> this year. I'm, like, I'm like great as long as I get to eat the uh, eat the, the fruits oh, of your labor <laughs> well sometimes um, there's like you know I'd rather be in the garden growing the plants if somebody else wants to cook them that's great <laughs> yeah yeah it's teamwork right, <laughs> right. well let's let's dive into um this this the work that you do on kind of the history and origins of crops so how does one even begin to to study domestication of like where domestic crops come from mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah yeah well in the in the case of oka i think it was pretty clear that they came from the andes but where in the andes and which wild species might be the wild you know, kind of the wild ancestor that was domesticated uh, to transform it into the crop is not that easy. Um, In the case of Oka, the actual genus Oxalis is huge. There's hundreds, someplace between 500 and 800 species, depending on the taxonomist, right? So, um, so, you know, where do you begin? Um, And uh, depending on the project, there may or may not already be worked on by previous people. In my case, the only clue was really some cytologists who did work in Argentina on a small number of plants um, that looked sort of like Oka, but they did some chromosome counting and found that they're based on a a base chromosome number, which is eight, um, which is um, rare in the genus overall. The genus has got a number of different base chromosome numbers, the the number in a set of chromosomes, Um, but most of them don't have eight. And Mm -hmm. and here's these, you know, they kind of look like Oka and they have the, and Oka has 64 chromosomes, so eight times eight. Um, And uh, so that was the start. And then um, once I got to go to the Andes and first Bolivia and then Peru, um, mm-hmm. I could look at herbarium specimens, um, the squash dead plants that are in the herbarium that um, sometimes have lost a lot of their characteristics by the time they're dead, but then find out, you know, oh, well, these ones look kind of like Oka and they're found in all these different places and then go to those places and look at the plants and, and collect some. And um, so, and and I found that even though everything I read before the first time I ever got to go to um, South America said, there are no wild oxalis known with tubers and no, no, you know, no, there's no wild tuber bearing oxalis known. Well, that's what it said in the things I was reading at home. Mm -hmm. But once I got there, you know, different Bolivian or Peruvian agronomists would say, sure there are. You know, we've seen them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can uh-huh. take to them. You know, <laughs> which is you know just I mean is a good demonstration of how you know local people know what 
international science does not. Um, <laughs> it's importance of collaborating with local scientists too. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, people, you know, brought me to some in Bolivia that had, you know, small tubers. And so I began, you know, being able to find some of those. And in my case, in back in the 90s in graduate school, I then was sequencing DNA of both wild ones that don't have tubers that, you know, look like Oka or the ones that do have tubers and then, you know, trying to piece together the family tree or the phylogeny of all these different species and how they're related to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then trying to find out, okay, if Oka has eight sets of chromosomes, each with eight chromosomes, um, that most... That's, you know, anytime you have more than two sets of chromosomes, that's called polyploidy. And most polyploids, not all, but most are actually formed by hybridization of different species. Um, so hmm, I'm not just looking for one wild species. I could be looking for two or three or four. Oh, <laughs> so wow. Yeah, the gets story gets really complicated. <laughs> yeah, and it yeah. gets, yeah, um, a lot of the techniques that people can use on animals that usually only have two sets of chromosomes or even on plants that have two sets of chromosomes, that, um, a lot of those things you can't even do um, with, with something that's got eight sets of chromosomes. So it gets a lot more challenging for sure. <laughs> and that has, been, that has been a challenge all the way along, um, but uh, makes it interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so... Um, and so, you know, looking for the, the ancestors of the domesticate, um, in many cases, people where the domesticate has already been identified, and I think people would be surprised at the number of crops where they have not been identified. But once you have, okay, this was the wild one, and this is the domesticated, you can start comparing them genetically and figured out what exact genes were targeted by selection, you know, thousands of years ago that transformed this one wild thing into the domesticate. Um, so I'm sorry to get away from plants for a minute, for a minute but of course, you know, yeah. um, if you had wolves and then you domesticated them into all these different kinds of dogs, different genes were, were selected to transform a wolf into dogs. Um, well, same thing with plants. So people can, but you kind of have to know which is the correct wild ancestor to be able to make those genetic comparisons. So that's one reason that we want to know which is the wild ancestor. You know, it's not just for fun. Um, also, if we do want to conserve those wild, those wild populations and keep them from disappearing, due to <laughs> yeah. land change or climate change or whatever it happens to be, it would be good to know which are the ones that are closest to the crop itself so that maybe someday some, you know, plant breeder might be able to make crosses that then give Oka more resistance to, oh, there's one of the things that really needs resistance to is that there's a, a weevil that um, mm -hmm. has larvae in the tubers and they're getting so bad that people are starting to give up growing oh open. no i've yeah. heard and and one of my students who was doing similar work also heard you know some of the farmers saying we can't eat these tubers that are full of tunnels of the maggots mm -hmm. of these of these yeah. weevil larvae. and you know we're just going to feed them to the pigs but i'm not going to keep growing oka just to feed to the kid the pigs so it's i mean mm. the it just isn't just a pest of the crop but if people are finding it so bad that they give up growing it it's a it's a a threat to the crop in other ways. So, um, yeah. you know, it would be great if somebody could come up with some resistance to that pest. Um, but if we could, you know, conserve those wild ones and know exactly which are the ones that are closest to Oka. Um, we haven't yet found a octoploid wild one. The, the wild one, tuber bearing ones that we have found are usually either tetraploid or hexaploid. Um, so even making those crosses would not be simple um, but yeah have, plant breeders have techniques um <laughs> yeah <so. laughs> well it's interesting too because i guess the the wild the wild ones that could be useful in crosses again and correct me if i'm wrong they wouldn't necessarily have to be tuber bearing 
right? It, it, they wouldn't the desired necessarily traits. have to be. I mean, we mm -hmm. have found a number of tuber bearing ones and it's interesting that some of my work suggested that maybe it could have been two different tuber bearing ones that crossed. And But mm -hmm. as I work with two different kinds of DNA data, we get sort of different conclusions about what the, you know, it, it, it hasn't always given us the same answers depending on which kinds of DNA markers we're using or things like that. So um, me, I'm hoping that I can finally finish the, uh, <laughs> the question that I started in my dissertation <laughs> ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, you wouldn't have to have, you know, you wouldn't have to have only wild tuber brain ones. I mean, presumably for domestication, something already had a tuber and people selected to get bigger tubers and such. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of the, the different genomes that went into the polyploid, they wouldn't have to. In fact, yeah. we haven't found any tuber bearing ones that are diploid yet. So, you know, maybe, you know, yeah, when you go back to the diploid level, you're probably okay. not all going to have uh, tubers. So when we think about the traits that people select for in many of our crops, it's often for increased size, increased pest resistance, or maybe reduction in bitterness or other kind of unpalatable characteristics. What are some of the traits that people have selected for with OCA? You've looked at many different types of OCA. What do you see as... as yeah, as well, exactly what you just okay. said. Um, actually, one of my former graduate students uh, Jane Bradbury had been looking at both um, maniac or cassava and oka in that very sense of mm. people usually over the course of domestication kind of select the ones that don't taste bitter or sour or are toxic or things like that. But then every once in a while, as we were saying earlier, you know, there are cases where they have a choice between good, you know, sweet tasting ones and sour or bitter or whatever and they keep on growing both hmm. and some people might be surprised why would you keep growing the bitter ones or the sour ones if you've got these other ones that aren't bitter or sour but then it turns out that sometimes there's a good reason and then if they know how to process it as we were saying earlier mm -hmm. then you know it might be time you know it might be a lot of work in some cases to process like the bitter manioc but um, but if they ha if they know how to leach out the poisons or you know the unpalatable compounds, then they might keep growing both. And that was actually the sort of the theme of Jane's dissertation. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that they do with Oka is that there are um, most of the most of the um, tubers are a little bit tart, but there's mm -hmm. a few that are extremely sour and um, what people do there is we were talking about kind of soaking them in a pool or otherwise leaching them before they dehydrated the tubers and um the the so then the dehydrated tubers can be kept indefinitely pretty much and then what people do with those that turned out when i asked people about you know how do you prepare okra for eating they would only have one or two ways but then when i remembered later to ask them well what do you do with a kaya which are the what they call these dried tubers then mm -hmm. they had all kinds of things to do and they would grind the dried tubers into a flour and then use the flat flour, the, the flour from the dried tubers to, um, you know, make little um, sort of, uh, uh, sort of um, pancake-like or fritter-like dishes, or um, they would use the flour from the ground up dried tubers to, um, uh, make sort of a pudding. Um, so there'd be a lot of different things that they could do with the dried tubers other than just reconstituting them and putting them in a soup. They have a lot of different things that they could do with that. Well, they can make those dried tubers from a lot of different varieties, mm. but it turned out when I was asking people about it, there were certain of the varieties that were much more sour than others. And those ones, they not only tended to grow in a separate field than all the other ones that might be mixed together, um, but they would also take those, instead of just setting them in the sun for a, for a week, the really sour ones, they would be the ones that they would always soak before de dehydrating the tubers um, because they were just oh. so sour otherwise. Um, 
And once I realized that, I realized, oh, we've got like this big, you know, a lot of varieties that are not that sour and then a few that are super sour. And I mostly, I was working in communities that, um, in the district of Pisach. So that's about an hour from Cusco City, if people mm -hmm. know Peruvian ge geography. And um, in that area, they had this, um, what looked like kind of one kind that was very sour and distinguished from all these other varieties that um, were a little bit sour, but not that sour. And um, I like to use this as an example of, you know, pay attention to what the local people are telling you. Tell it, pay attention to what, you know, ethnobotany. Um, yeah. <laughs> you have to have the ethno and the botany, right? <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to say that, uh, you know, indigenous knowledge is only useful for, you know, then being tested by Western sciences. That's not. Of course not. No, no. Um, but. I've seen people at the time who were looking at, you know, DNA data of a different kind, bunch of different kinds of oka from that region, and they mm -hmm. didn't notice how separate, just genetically distinct, um, the one kind were from the other. So for those who were watching the video, um, I have a display of oka from one family and the two tubers that are at the bottom um, of the two of the rows above are the super sour ones. Um, they're called poshko, poshko in Quechua, which means either sour or fermented, which are both words that are Are, are these the deep purple ones, Eve, or the ones that are, no, that are down kind of at a the yellow very color? Bottom, okay. The yellow mm -hmm. ones at the very bottom next yeah. to the pen. And um, those are, you know, there are other yellow ones that look almost identical. Mm -hmm. so if I was asking people to identify tubers, they would sort of um, maybe give the name of one of the other yellow ones and then take a tiny taste and go, oh, no, no, that's Polska. That's, you know, that's the really <laughs> sour stuff. Um, and uh, so that one really is not eaten without turning it into the dried tubers because it's so sour. It can't just setting it in the sun for mm. a few days is not going to be enough to make it palatable to get rid of um, that oxalic acid yeah, i would love so to like look at the chemistry of these i mean when you see that rainbow of colors from yellows to reds yeah. to deep deep purple i mean those those yellow those reds and purples are often indicative of anthocyanins which have yeah. you know antioxidant yeah. properties have have people looked into these other metabolites yet um, or? i haven't looked into the anth well i shouldn't say that actually i think there are some studies uh like the International Potato Center and stuff okay. that have been looking mm -hmm. a bit at that. Um, and so, yeah, the different pigments. And you could say that that's something that people could be have selected for in terms of just selecting for a diversity of different colors. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, one of the things that we found, um, you know, I had been paying attention to what the farmer said, and they were considering those really super ones almost as if they're a separate crop from Oka. Um, mm -hmm. But then when we started looking at them in terms of their DNA and saw that they were distinctive um, in some molecular, um, some aspects of their DNA, they came out separate from the other ones. And then um, we looked at the oxalic acid levels. We were not able to look at the other organic acids that we know like are re drastically reduced during that sunning process. Um, but we, yeah, we couldn't, we could only look at the or, um, oxalic acid levels and um, found that those really acid ones, not only did they have three times as much, more approximately three times as mm -hmm. much oxalic acid as the other ones, but only the ones that had a lower ploidy level. So they were, had, were only tetraploid, not octoploid. Interesting. And that was like, oh, now we didn't know that. And again, <laughs> I'll say, um, you know, we wouldn't have known to look for it if I had not been talking to the farmers and realizing that they were separating them out like that. So mm -hmm. um, that's something we would like to follow up on in terms of process of domestication and that there's still these very sour tetraploid ones available, but you know, um, even though there's also the other ones that are not as sour, um, but in terms of both domestication and polyploidy, and it could be very complicated and maybe we'll never be able to tease it apart, <laughs> but, um, but I would like to try. Um, so. That's great.
Well, this leads in beautifully to my, my last question. And that's really kind of what are your hopes? What are your future plans for research on Oka? Like where, where do you want to go with your work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I have been able, I'll just mention that in terms of the conservation that I went into, went back to school for and everything after many years of, um, you know, doing field work in Peru and Bolivia and everything else. Finally, there was one aspect that, um, I, yeah, I got, got to travel all over and collect wild relatives, including both, um, ones with tubers and ones without tubers in the picture right now is, was me with a, what's probably a new species of oxalis. It doesn't have tubers. It's definitely, um, well, by just the way, looking at it, I can tell it's part of the, the group closely related to Oka. It does not have tubers, but it's probably a new species. So that's interesting. Wow. Um, but I was also able to travel in collaboration with people from the Bolivian um, National Institute of, um, of Agricultural and Forestry Research um, and Innovation. And um, then we're traveling with them and collecting wild plants. And then they have them now in a greenhouse um, that is a germplasm collection of wild relatives of Oka um, from um, throughout Bolivia, including the ones with tubers, but also ones without tubers. And I feel like, okay, so maybe this is actually a contribution to conservation, aside from like writing scientific papers, maybe, you know, this little germplasm collection might actually help to conserve uh, a little bit of these um, populations. So um, that's something that I feel good about. Um, I guess in terms of future, I think I mentioned wishing that I could finish this project that I started in graduate school in terms of, um, yeah, the picture now is the uh, is the germplasm collection of wild oxalis related to Oka um, that's being maintained by the Bolivian government right now and an agency of the Bolivian government. Um, so I'm proud to have been able to um, collaborate on the formation of this living collection in Bolivia. Um, um, in terms of trying to figure out finally really nail down the um, what the ancestors of of domestication and polyploidy of Oka are. Um, I mentioned that different kinds of DNA data were giving us different answers. And now there's all these new techniques for um, long read genetic sequencing. And there's actually new methods just in the past few years that make the possibility of doing this with an octoploid actually possible. Mm. Um, for years, it just seemed like, well, yeah, there is new methods, but you can't use them on a polyploid. And, you know, it just looked hopeless, but now it doesn't look hopeless anymore. Um, so I'd like to go back to get better sampling in better geographic representation mm -hmm. of sampling in different parts. I've already been back to Bolivia and the two places, areas of Peru where there are different populations of wild ones with little tiny tubers. Um, but I'd like to fill in a gap sort of in Northwestern Argentina, where I, I assume that they would be, but we haven't gotten them from that area yet. So once we had that, then I think we could go back with all these new techniques and be able to, I hope, pinpoint which area of the Andes, if it's someplace in Bolivia or someplace, you know, in another part of the Andes, can we figure out where Oka was originally domesticated. And then from there, then begin to say, well, what about all this? You know, were um, tubers only in the polyploids? And, you know, then people selected for bigger tubers. What, what about that oxalic acid? Um, mm -hmm. The interplay of polyploidy and domestication in the evolution of less acid um, varieties and keeping the, a few of the higher acid varieties, I think there's a lot more we can do with this whole system. Yeah, um, so. it's it's a beautiful system because you're you're incorporating indigenous knowledge, you know, agro ecology, <laughs> um, <laughs> genetics, uh, botany. I mean, there's a lot of different pieces um, that go into um, this type of investigation. Yep. And, Keeps it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Well, and I'm excited to see what you find using these new techniques. I think that's one of the most exciting things that we have today in science is as new 
analytical technologies emerge, being able to apply those to older problems that we've been working on and look at them through a new light. That's really exciting. Yeah. 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 I hope we can, I hope we'll be able to do it. Yeah. Sure. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Eve. It was great speaking with you. Oh, I'm really glad to do it. And I appreciate the opportunity. Great. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Um, I want to send out a shout out of thanks to our producers, to Co-Conspiracy Entertainment, Rob Cohen and Christine Roth um, for producing the show. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in every week. Remember, my request and plea this week is share the podcast with at least one friend. Let's build out that audience and share all this great information that we have on the show um, about crops, about the future food, the links between food and medicine with an even broader audience. All right, that's it for now. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.